Hi, it's Chris with Implied Music. Where to begin? I get this question a lot. And music theory is a really broad notion. And there's probably a lot of ways to approach being a musician and thinking logically and clearly about your own music. But there's no question that as you know, human beings and uh, with human brains and minds, one of the most important tools we have is naming stuff. So let's talk today about naming notes. If you're a musician who is brought up from a young age playing piano or any conventional European instrument, naming notes may seem like you're a fish and the note names are just the water you're swimming and you may not even notice it. And yet, those note names are arbitrary and they're conventional. And in a way, it's kind of good that they exist because it'd be super difficult to talk to other musicians about the specifics of scales, melodies, chords without having good, strong, conventional, consistent names for each of those notes. Now, you may be one of those musicians for whom it's actually not that important to name notes. This video may not be for you. But if you're interested in talking to other musicians, um, learning in depth about more complicated chord and melodic structures, you'll have to sort of integrate some of this knowledge into your, you know, vocabulary. So I want to talk as much as possible sort of from the ground up, and it'll mean kind of going slowly sometimes, although I'll try to keep this brief. We'll be talking about equal temperament, which is a way of dividing an octave into 12 equal bits and giving a name to each of those equal bits. It's part of the uh, tradition of European classical music. It's been adopted kind of worldwide, and so it's worth knowing. It's also worth noting that if you're using, you know, most sampled instruments or the instruments that sort of like came bundled with your DAW or garage band, almost all of those instruments are going to be created and constructed in equal temperament. It's not true universally, but it's, it's worth acknowledging that it exists. Listen, let's hop into why we name notes the way we name them and uh, how we can use it in our own work. Notes are arranged in letters. This key here on a piano is called A. And in the old days, kind of the most in the old days, I mean like early church music, 11th century, this particular scale, which is white keys from A to A, really the G is the last note of the scale, was a natural minor scale. It got used in a lot of church music. So we have a scale that goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. There are seven letters in the musical alphabet, only seven. That's a minor scale. Now, sometimes people ask me, well, why does the major scale begin on C? Later on in the world, the major scale become, becomes dominant, you know, becomes more uh, important. And so we're left with this set of notes, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. So far, I've only played white keys, and I've created two scales, a natural minor, which is kind of an early church mode and still used for tons of music everywhere all around the world, and the what we might call the natural major. It's called the Ionian major, the normal major scale that everyone knows from Do a Deer. A major scale is constructed of two tetrachords between C and D is a whole step. There's a note in between. Between D and E is a whole step. There's a note in between. Between E and F ain't no note in between. Whole step, whole step, half step. I'm going to play that without a thumb. I'm going to use these four fingers. The top of the major scale is connected by a whole step, and this is also a tetrachord, a four-note pattern. Whole step, whole step, 
And look, there's no half step in between those two notes. It's a tetrachord G, A, B, C. A major scale is constructed of two tetrachords. Great, Chris. Thanks so much. It's so totally evident. But the problem is lots of music uses more than a major scale and uses more than the key of C, right? Let's name the black keys on the piano or the other notes on guitar. Now, guitarists really tend to think of only sharps, but there's two ways of naming every black key on the piano. There's C, there's D. This black key is in between the two of them. We can call this black, black key C sharp or D flat. I may spell in musical notation this black key as C sharp or D flat. So C sharp or D flat. And then there's a D and there's an E. D sharp or E flat. You get it, right? I'm not going to go through all of them. That's a G flat or F sharp. I am going to go through all of them. A flat or G sharp, B flat or A sharp. There's only five black keys. There it is. Well, that's great. But what about starting a scale on a note that is something besides C? All right, look at this. Whole step, whole step. There's the note that's in between. Half step, whole step, whole step, half step. And then here's my whole step, whole step, half step, tetrachord on the top. My computer correctly identifies this as a D Ionian scale, a D major scale. And it uses two black keys. Those two black keys have to be named. We got to call them something. So there's a rule, and this is your very first rule for naming and talking about notes. A major scale, and almost all music uses scales, has to have one of every letter name. So when I get from D to E and I go to the next note, the next note is some kind of F. It is F sharp. This note could also be spelled G flat, couldn't it? We know that the name of this note could be F sharp or G flat, but that would be silly because then I'd have a scale that does this. D, E, G flat, G. I have two G's in my scale. A, B, D flat, D. In a D scale, I have a D flat. It doesn't make sense. In fact, here's an example of three different scales. The first scale here is the C major scale. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. The second scale in this measure, the top and the bottom, are identical scales. And yet on the page, I've spelled them differently. This top one, I have to say, looks a mess. It's the example that I just gave. D, E, G flat, G, A, B, D flat, D. It's a headache to read and doesn't make sense in terms of that thing that we know exists called key signatures. And we'll talk about those in a second. Here's the correct way to spell this scale. And it's not just about notation. It's about how we think about what we're doing. D, E, F sharp. There's an F. G, A, B, C sharp, D. That's lovely. It's correctly spelled. I'm going to just give you one more example, and then we're going to talk a little bit about key signatures. Well, what if I start a scale on uh, a black key? Well, look down below. There's an E flat, F, G, A flat. And that's my whole step, whole step, whole step. And then I have B flat, C, D, and then E flat on the top. And that's whole step, whole step, half step. My computer correctly identifies that as E flat Ionian. And the names of the notes are E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat, C, D, and then E flat again. 
all of the notes are named in flats. Why? Because of our rule, you have to have one of every letter. Here's the correct way to spell that. You can see the E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat, C, D, E flat. It makes a nice, lovely, smooth, direct, straight line from the top to the bottom and the bottom to the top. If you look down here, if I spell this first note as D sharp, I get a skippity skip visually. And that visual skip does not exist in my ear. It just sounds like a whole step. On the page, it looks like a third. I like that. And then I get to G, and then it's G sharp. No, that doesn't make any sense at all, having two Gs. And then this thing here as A sharp, it looks like another skip. Oh, this is bad. It's hard to read, and yet it sounds just fine. And this is, what is this? Is this a D sharp major scale? Oh, God, no. Questions around this stuff come up with my students constantly. I know it's a useful pursuit, and yet until you really kind of bump up against it, it's going to be difficult to think about and maybe convince yourself that it's useful to study. I can assure you it is. Let's talk about key signatures, those funny collections of sharps and flats that exist at the beginning of notation and that, you know, you talk about when you're talking with your buddies. Here's a simple manuscript view of what the key of C looks like on the page when you're a, you know, pianist or, you know, reading any kind of score. You've got a uh, staff up on the top for kind of high notes for the right hand and a staff down below for low notes. And uh, each of these lines and spaces represents a specific sort of pitch class, an, an F, a specific F. For instance, this bottom space here is that F. Now, as we have just discovered, sometimes that F needs to be F sharp to make a scale. But even a smart computer sometimes makes mistakes. Can you see the stack of notes that are appearing on the screen? The computer has incorrectly identified the key that I'm playing here, which I say is C sharp as D flat. Computers are stupid. They only know what you tell them. Let's tell this computer program that we are not in the key of C, but rather in the key of D. And now the key signature has changed. Every C is a C sharp. Every F is an F sharp. And that's true in the bass or left hand as well. Every C is a C sharp. Every F is an F sharp. Whenever I come to a C in the music, whenever I come to an F in the music, it's an F sharp. I don't therefore need to put a sharp in front of it. And that's what key signatures do for us. They establish a field of action in which we're going to play our music. The uh, 15 conventional key signatures are all a result and those are the major ones, are all a result of finding ways to spell scales that use one of every letter. There are some unusual key signatures, like, for instance, C-flat, which has seven flats. There are key signatures that um, are exactly the same notes, but which spell them differently. Spelling is um, conventional. It's something that we establish so that we can communicate with our fellow musicians and talk about important elements of our music, like the set of notes that we're working with for a piece or how triads interact with each other. Spelling triads becomes a really important idea when you talk about harmony and functional harmony. When you're working on a song and you've got a collection of chords, it's really interesting to kind of take a look at them and ask yourself, well, the G is always sharp in all of these chords, but maybe this is better spelled as an A flat because this is an F minor chord. And if that's an F minor chord, is it the one chord of the key signature? Is it the minor four? You see what I mean? If I'm playing in the key of C, and I play an F chord, and then I play an F minor chord, 
I really don't want to talk to my keyboard player and say, well, there's an F chord and then there's an F chord with a G sharp in it. Very confusing. If you're working by yourself, not super important. I get that. But if you're working by yourself in your DAW, sometimes your computer will tell you stuff that's just plain misleading and confusing. I think that the questions that my students come to me with around this kind of stuff are a result of the interaction between some knowledge and the confusing spellings that may appear on this computer screen sometime and the kind of sometimes misleading discussions that they have with their fellow musicians. These traditions and conventions, which kind of go back centuries, are there just to kind of make the path to making better music easier. When someone asks me where to begin, I usually say, start with naming notes. Well, I hope this has been useful. Like and subscribe. Ding the bell. You'll be notified when I do my videos. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.